When one thing you own accidentally becomes many things, the chances are you'll try and make it one thing again with glue. Many of us will have spent countless hours lovingly building models of airplanes, tanks, space rockets and trains with varying results. The woodworker uses PVA glues to bond and laminate. The bricklayer uses cement to bind his bricks together. Plumbers use bonding adhesives to stem the flow of leaking pipes. And there are few children who haven't spread glitter to every corner of the house in an attempt to create a fantastic work of art. It is so common that dozens of different glues for thousands of different uses are likely to be found somewhere in almost all of our houses. But glue isn't a modern invention. In fact, glue can arguably be said to be as old as mankind itself. Homo sapiens first emerged in Africa around 230 to 250,000 years ago. They were anatomically identical to us and closely related to several subgroups of humans that then existed. But the one thing that set them apart was their ability to not just fashion tools. Tools, simple tools at least, were likely common amongst other subgroups, but archaeological evidence exists that shows how early Homo sapiens used natural glues to bond flint blades to spears and arrows. This was no more than birch and pine resins thickened in the sun, moulded around the tip of a spear and held next to the fire to produce a simple but effective adhesive that gave early humans a great advantage in their hunting of animals. Glue was also used by early humans, though, in a more ritualistic way. Prehistoric cave paintings are found on every continent, and though their true purpose remains largely conjectural, it is likely that they were totems of ritual, perhaps to bring a good hunt or keep the tribe healthy. The oldest reliably dated cave art can be found at Altamira in Spain. Discovered in the 19th century, depictions of ochre and charcoal images of handprints, bison and horses are so vibrant and well-preserved that many in the archaeological field dismissed them as fakes. It is now known from carbon dating techniques that these paintings are over 35,000 years old, and the reason they are so well-preserved and that the colours remain so strong and vibrant is entirely due to the use of glue. Analysis has shown that some of the charcoal and ochre pigments were mixed with milk, the proteins in the milk then helping to form a strong adhesive. Others were mixed with resin from various trees and starch from plants, and this resulted in an adherent which not only bonded the pigments to the walls of the caves, but also acted, perhaps accidentally, as a preservative. This, coupled with the fact that many pieces of prehistoric artwork were rendered in deep caves well beyond the reach of the bleaching action of sunlight, means that even today the animals depicted in the paintings can easily be identified. It is thought that the first animal glues, made from the slow boiling of hides, hooves and connective tissues, began in Egypt around 6,000 years ago. Again, the system of producing glue from these materials demanded a precise process of heating, cooling and the inclusion of chemical additives at specific points within that process. This resulted in a strong, clear liquid glue. The process would have been time-consuming and the additives very expensive, so it was likely that only the very wealthy would have been able to afford the goods manufactured using such glues. Some of the finest examples of pieces of ancient Egyptian furniture come from the tomb of the boy king, Tutankhamun, who ruled Egypt 3,300 years ago. Chemical analysis of the treasures discovered by Howard Carter in 1922 have revealed some of the woodwork to be made using a complex system of laminates bonded by animal glues. Many ancient papyrus documents discovered in the Egyptian deserts and having survived the ravages of time have allowed us great insights into the Egyptian culture during the time of the pharaohs. Their survival is not entirely due to the robust nature of papyrus itself, but the fact that these sheets of papyrus were treated with glue after they were written on. It is likely that the scribes discovered that this method would protect the documents in the harsh climate. It is unlikely that they realised precisely how effective that treatment would be, but it has allowed experts to read the words thousands of years after they were written. The Roman Empire also made use of glues and adhesives, although unusually for a civilization known for its advances, they didn't seem to evolve the process of glue manufacture in any great measure. 
They used cement to bond the tesserae of mosaics into walls and floors. They used pitch adhesive to protect the keel of boats and ships. But otherwise, glue changed very little, if at all, during the time of the Romans. In 1476, William Caxton brought the first printing press into Britain. This allowed the price of books to drop dramatically and gave those of modest means the chance to finally own them. In order to reduce the cost further, bookbinders needed to replace the expensive animal glues that had been in use for centuries. They turned to a herbalist glue that had likely been in use for many, many years and made from the bluebell. The great 16th century herbalist William Turner wrote in his herbal of 1568, the boys of Northumberland, the scrape of the root of the harebell, and glue their arrows and bulks with the slime that they scrape thereof. There is no doubt that people had found uses for the glue of the bluebell bulb for centuries before William Turner finally put it to paper. Even before the Industrial Revolution began in Britain and swept across Europe, glue was in mass production. The first commercial manufactory of glue began in Holland in 1700, very soon after followed by factories in England, Germany, Switzerland and in the British colonies of North America and there were no shortage of animals to feed this manufacturing process. When a cart or plough horse reached the ends of its usefulness, or a cow, pig or goat became too old to be of any use to its owner, it would be taken along to the glue factory. The owner would receive a few shillings for the beast, and the factory would eventually turn the creature into glue for which the demand was high. By the mid-1800s, the first rubber-based glues were introduced. Modern chemistry has since then allowed for the heavy development of synthetically produced adhesives, and those of us who were around in the 1950s, 60s and 70s will still remember being able to buy cow gum. The name of the product harked back to a time when most glues were made from rendered animals, although the actual brand of cow gum contained no animal products at all and was no more than a petroleum solvent-based polymer. By the 20th century, polyvinyl acetate, or as it is more commonly known, PVA, was being used by joiners and carpenters across the globe. Solvent-based petroleum glues were being used to bond metals, vinyl glues could be used on plastics without fear of melting them, and even to this day, urea formaldehyde glue is used to stick the wings on passenger aircraft. The next time you're flying in a passenger jet, just think, there are no rivets or welds holding those wings on, it's just a thin layer of polymer glue. But of the many and various natural and synthetic glues in use today, there is one that will outstick them all, and it was accidentally discovered twice by the same man. Harry Wesley Coover was born in Delaware in 1917. He earned a degree in chemistry from Hobart College in New York, which allowed him to gain a master's and later a PhD in organic chemistry. His dissertation for his doctorate was on the commercial synthesis of vitamin B6, a subject he intended to continue working on, but when the USA joined the fight of World War II in late 1941, the process he had developed was commandeered by the US Army for use in the war effort. Being a patriot, Coover took a position with the B.F. Goodrich Company, who were working on various projects to give the Allies the upper hand against the Axis powers in Europe. One of the problems encountered by the US troops was their gun sights would easily fog up, so Goodrich put Coover to work on developing a clear plastic lens for the gun sights that would resist fogging, giving the soldier back the precious seconds he might spend having to clean the lenses. It was during this time that Coover discovered cyanoacrylate, a clear liquid compound that stuck to absolutely everything it touched, which, if they had managed to produce those plastic lenses successfully, could have been used to fix them firmly in place. But at that time, it was just a hindrance to the project. Coover and his team abandoned their work with cyanoacrylate to explore other avenues, none of them considering the possible commercial potential of the compound. After the war, Coover took a position with the Eastman Kodak Company, and in 1956, he and his team were working to create heat-resistant polymers to be used in the construction of jet fighter canopies. It was during work on this project that a teen colleague of Coover's, the aptly named Fred Joyner, chanced once more upon the cyanoacrylate compound. 
Eastman Kodak soon realised the compound might be of interest to consumers and decided to invest in a production run to test its commercial potential. So it was that in 1958, the first commercial superglue made its appearance under the somewhat uninspiring brand name of Eastman Number no. 910. Ed White, you're one of the strongest men in football, but I'll bet you that one drop of Eastman 910 adhesive is stronger than you are. No way. It's been less than a minute, and even you won't be able to pull them apart. Oh, come on. If just one drop of Eastman 910 is stronger than Ed White, mm. imagine how it can handle the tough jobs around the house. <clears throat> Incredible. There are stories of medics using cyanoacrylate adhesive to close wounds on the battlefields of World War II, but considering it wasn't discovered until 1942, these are almost certainly apocryphal. Medics may have tried to use other adhesives as a last resort during World War II, but superglue certainly wasn't one of them. What is certain, however, is that it was used by the American forces during the Vietnam War. While the Vietnam War raged on, American casualty numbers were increasing at an alarming rate. A medic attending to the wounds of an injured soldier in the remote jungles of Vietnam would stand a far greater chance of saving the soldier's life if any bleeding could be stopped quickly. Ideally, a helicopter would be called in to evacuate into a medical facility, but due to the terrain, the remote location of many troop sorties, and the guerrilla tactics of the Viet Cong who would lie in wait for US aircraft, it was not always possible to evacuate the injured soldiers. But the US Army are a resourceful bunch, and though superglue was never officially sanctioned for use by the US Army, the medics would use the glue from the engineer's kit to instantly bond the wounds of the soldier back together, vastly reducing the blood flow and buying valuable time for the injured men. This no doubt caused its own problems for the surgeons back at the field hospital, but lives were being saved. Since then, cyanoacrylate adhesives have been specifically developed for use in medicine with products like Dermabond being used successfully across the world. Cyanoacrylate adhesive is now ubiquitous with brand names like Superglue, Gorilla Glue, Loctite 404 and Crazy Glue being well known across the globe. It's used every day in industry and in homes around the world. It is used for everything from repairing a child's beloved toy to sticking the wings to a passenger jet, in the manufacture of clothing in the fashion industry and a million other applications where two things need to be joined together without the danger of them separating once more. None of these things would have been possible had it not been for one man's chance discovery during World War II that went on to create a valuable product. And the product was recognised to be of such importance that in 2004, Henry Kuva was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. And in 2010, he was awarded the National Medal of Technology and Innovation by President Barack Obama himself. To Harry W. Coover, Eastman Chemical Company, for his invention of cyanoacrylates, novel adhesives known widely to consumers as superglues, which today play significant roles in medicine and industry. This product not only repairs the everyday objects that have become damaged and broken, it has saved lives on the battlefield. And all this was discovered through the pain of progress. <laughs>